Many of us have been doing church differently. Sunday mornings have become a bit more casual. Living rooms have become sanctuaries and fellowship has a new, less personal touch. It hasn't been easy, yet here we are. Gathering, worshipping, learning, being the church. Now, more than ever, we are reminded of a simple truth. The church is not a building, it's the body of Christ. It isn't built with bricks and mortar, but with faith and hope and love. In the midst of uncertainty, our calling remains the same, to share the truth of the gospel with a world God loves. Throughout history, the church has grown in difficult times, and today is no different. We are still the church, we're just doing things a bit differently. Good morning and welcome to everybody. It's great to see you all here this morning. My name is uh, Paul Aldridge and we are the Estuary Elam Churches. We are many people in four locations. We are in Ashingdon and Rayleigh, which are small towns in Essex, and South End, which is soon to become a city. We are also online. You join us this morning on the online service. So welcome to our online service this morning. Isaiah 55 one says, all you people who are thirsty, come, here is water for you to drink. Don't worry if you have no money, come eat and drink until you are full. You don't need money, the milk and wine are free. So this morning, if you are thirsty for more of Jesus, then you can come before him this morning and worship him and give him all the glory and he will come into your life. He will just surround you with his love and everything that he gives us, which is completely free. Let's bow our heads and pray to open the service this morning. Father God, we come before you this morning to celebrate your goodness as this part of your church. Lord God, we are thirsty for more of you this morning. We come together to worship you. We come together to praise you and give you all the glory this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This morning, our magical minister is back, but it, I'm afraid it's a rerun. So you've probably seen it before, but there you go. The magical minister for the children's slot this morning. Hello, it's Pastor Paul, the Magical Minister, here yet again with another trick for you this Sunday morning. Now today, I have a simple little trick for you that doesn't involve any fancy magician -y things. There's no weird looking apparatus with oriental writing on it, no. All I have is a pen and a ring. Now you can't get much more normal than that, can you? Yet what I'm going to do is far from normal. I'm going to do something that's going to amaze you as I do a, a gravity defying, mind boggling, law of physics defying, death defying. Oh, all right then, it's not really death defying. I got carried away and made that bit up, but it's a pretty good trick. You see, anybody can make a ring drop off the end of this pen. I mean, you just turn it upside down and gravity does the rest. It just drops off. Anybody can do that. 
but only a magician can make it defy gravity and rise up the pen and drop off the end. Pretty good, eh? I mean, if I can do that, they might give me my own TV show. I can just imagine it. An evening with the magician impossible, the magical minister. <sighs> Sorry about that. I was dreaming for a moment there. Now, here's the trick. Are you watching? Are you ready? Here we go. Let's not forget the magic words. Oogie googly. But it reminds me of something that Jesus said about real faith. He said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I don't think he's talking about real mountains. I mean, God could do that if he really wanted to. But Jesus is making the point that even the tiniest bit of faith in him, faith the size of a teensy weensy mustard seed, can accomplish great things. In other words, if we have even the smallest amount of faith, it could do great mountain sized things because God specializes in moving the obstacles that are like mountains in our lives. Nothing is too big for him to overcome. We just need to trust in him. Thank you for watching. We all need a bit of motivation from time to time, don't we? And especially so in today's world. And what I have to say this morning is at least meant to be motivational. My first point is simply this. God loves you. He believes in you. And he has a significant plan for your life. It's as simple as that. But if we can truly grasp hold of that simple truth, not just in our head, but with our heart, it can be life changing. Our theme, of course, is significant seasons. And in this significant season, he has a great plan for you. I love what Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 tells us. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And we see, friends, that that's his goal. That verse sums up his purposes for your life and for my life. And our part is to make sure we follow his plan. How many know that if God says something is significant, it's not going to be average? Now, there's nothing particularly wrong with average, except it's just that. It's average. It's mediocre. But God's plan for this season is not mediocre. It's not average. It's a significant season. To be perfectly honest, I don't think he ever intended us to be average at anything. Let me ask you, did Jesus come to give us an average life or a more abundant life? <laughs> a more abundant one. Does he call us to be an average conqueror in life or more than a conqueror? Oh, more than a conqueror. He wants us to be overcomers. God's plans for us are always filled with the significant. And I feel that God has been showing me that the start of this new season is a bit like the passing of the baton in a relay race. And that he's looking for you and I to take hold of that baton and run with it in order to advance the kingdom of God in this generation. And it's that idea that I want to explore a little this morning. Hebrews 12 and verse 1 tells us, run with perseverance the race marked out for you. Now, in a relay race, each of the runners have a, a race individually marked out for them. 
In Psalm 139, the psalmist says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And friends, there's a race marked out for you. It's written in God's book. But in a relay race, how many know that whilst there are individual races, that's not the whole picture. It's much bigger than that because they all play their part. Each runner runs a different leg at a different time, but it's only together that they form the race. As one runner finishes his race, another runner starts his. Each new lap of the course is important. It's equally demanding and each has equal potential for drama. Until the final lap, that is, because surely, ultimately, it's the way you finish that really counts, isn't it? Well, whether it is or not, perceived wisdom is often that you save the best until last. But the truth is, each leg of that race, that season, if you will, is equally important. If each leg is not run properly, then it leaves the final guy a lot to do. Now, I don't know which leg of the race we are in, friends, and I'm definitely not certain exactly where we are prophetically in God's end time plans. And I don't know how many legs there's going to be, but I do know this. This is a significant season, significant for us as a church and for us as individuals. And I know that whatever leg it turns out to be, however many more there are, this one is important. Which means it's important that we each play our part. We need to put on our running shoes and run the race with all of our hearts so that we can pass the baton on for the next leg. Now notice it's we. It's our race. It's our leg. It's our significant season. No one can run this except us together. For however long this leg of the race, this season is, the baton is in our hands, no one else's. Our team captain, Jesus, has assigned it to us. I can't do what you've been called to do. You can't do what I've been called to do. But together, we are a team. Together, we are the church. Together, we are the one body of Christ. I want you to picture this with me. The first runner, he's almost completed his own race. He's coming around the last bend. He's in the final few meters, probably got a hundred meters to go. And he can already see the guy who is running the next leg getting ready. Now that's you and I. But even so, every second counts. Our runner can't afford to let up just yet. This next part for him is just as important as any part of his race. This is the changeover moment, the passing of the baton. Races have been won and lost in these moments, and it's all been meticulously re rehearsed and worked out. Timing is critical. The next runner is totally dependent upon his getting this right. He can't afford to drop the baton. And so the next runner is looking behind him. He's judging the distance and he, and he starts running, but his, his speed is checked. He's, he's running half blind. He's still dependent on the previous runner. He's got one arm trailing behind, ready to grasp the baton. Eyes now are fastened dead ahead. He can't afford to look back again. He begins to pick up speed as he goes and he's ready to burst into full sprint the moment that he feels the baton placed into his hands. And he feels it and he steps into his destiny because it's his race now. Friends, I want to tell you, we're the ones with the trailing arm. We're the ones ready to grasp the baton. Now, passing the baton means to bestow one's responsibility or job upon someone else. It's the same kind of imagery that the Apostle Paul used in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23, where he's talking about communion. He says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. So he received the baton from the Lord and then he in turn passed it on to them and it's their job to pass it on again. And he uses the same imagery in chapter 15 and verse 3 where he says, For what I received, 
I passed on to you as of first importance. And then he outlines the gospel message that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, what's Paul saying if he's not saying, don't drop the baton on this, guys? You know, I'm bestowing the responsibility of the baton of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ onto you. You know, this is how people get God's forgiveness. And if you mess up with this, you know, if you if you drop the baton, then your running won't be in vain. Friends, in the new leg, the new season, the runner benefits from what has gone of, gone before. Just as you and I have benefited from the previous season. Some of us have been in that previous season. And it takes it's taken a lot to get us where we are right now. But friends, it's a new significant season now. And we've got to grasp the baton and run with it. We need to recognise the responsibility is ours now. The responsibility for the gospel. I do want to add this thought though. It might be a new leg. It might be a new season. But it's still all of their race too. See, when the medals are handed out at the end, it won't just be you. It won't just be the last runner who stands there. We will all stand there together, all the competitors in that race. However many legs, however many season it takes to win the race and obtain the prize. We're now going to have a short time of prayer together. So whether you're watching this online through our online church service or whether you're at our live uh, hybrid service at Ashenden or whether you're watching this after the event let's pray together wherever we are so we're going to pray for those who are experiencing fatigue and weariness in this season as we enter this winter period those working on the front line those known to us in our families and community let's pray that we will all find both rest and strength in God to keep going We've got 90 seconds, let's go. Hebrews 12 and verse 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I love the Living Bible version of that verse. It says this, since we have such a huge crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands, let us strip off everything that slows us down or holds us back. And especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up. And let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. Can you see the picture being painted for us here? 
Now, believe it or not, I used to be an athlete in my school days and I, I ran several races. And I can vividly remember the sound of our fellow athletes as they cheered us on to the finish. And that's the kind of picture we have here. Only this isn't just fellow athletes, is it? This is all heaven cheering us on to run our race. Friends, it's good to know before whom you are standing. It's good to know that you're not in this on your own, that there are those who are supporting you. And so if you find yourself struggling in the race, and that's not unusual, I want to tell you that that's actually normal. That's why God uses words like perseverance and patience, because the race that you and I are called to is an endurance race. It's not a walk in the park. It costs. In fact, that's what it's all about. The prize is on the other side of our perseverance. But I want to say this, not everyone who starts the race will finish the race. Now, I'm not talking about people not going to heaven. I'm talking about them not finishing the race that's been marked out for them. And so missing out on God's best. You see, some will give up because it just seems too hard. Have you ever noticed that, you know, we will wait for God to tell us we should start something and we'll probably want triple confirmation first. But we don't very often wait for his permission to give up. And then we blame God for letting us down. But it's actually us who gave up. And then there's some who won't even start the race. They won't start the new season. They'll reject it. And friends, this is when God sends the tipper of the vessels. Do you remember them? When Moab was likened to stale sour wine that hadn't been tipped from jar to jar. And God says, the days are coming when I will send men who will pour her out and empty her pitches and smash her jars. And that was God's way of telling Moab, you're going to change whether you like it or not. Because you, if you're awkward and don't change on your own, then I'm going to send someone to change you. And that's exactly what God did. How many know you can't argue with God? Some will start and then they'll get distracted and they'll veer out of their lane. Have you ever watched a race where the runners are, are very close together? And in that close huddle, there's a bit of argy-bargy, as I call it, going on. Someone pushes another runner or they catch their ankle and they put the other runner off balance. Or they stumble and fall like Zola Budd and Mary Decker in the 3000 metres at the 1984 Olympics. I was listening to an Olympic swimmer being interviewed about the difference lockdown has made to them. And one of the things they missed the most, the thing that they felt could make all the difference between their setting a new record or not, is the cheering and support of the crowd. Why? Because it's that support that causes them to dig deeper than they've ever done before. Friends, in trying times, it's good to remember that all heaven is with you. It's time to open your spiritual eyes and see that they are cheering you on to the finish line. Remember the prophet Elisha in Second Kings chapter 6. The servant came to Elisha in a bit of a panic because they were they were surrounded by an army. And Elisha told him not to be afraid. And he said these wonderful words, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed. He said, open their, his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And it says, then the Lord opened the servant's eyes. And he looked and saw the hills full of horses and, and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Friends, I want to tell you this morning, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. There's a huge crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands. All heaven is cheering you on. 
And it's not just heaven. It's your brothers and sisters in Christ running alongside you, encouraging you, praying for you, lifting you up, cheering you on. And there will be times when it will be your turn to encourage and cheer them on because we are in the same race, friends. We're in this significant season together. Now, to close, I want you to picture the guy on the next leg, the guy that represents us this morning. He's waiting in his lane. It's not quite his turn yet. You could say he's marking time. But there's danger here, because if he's not careful, he will be like the goalkeeper who's caught on the hop because all the action so far had been down in the other half of the pitch and he's got distracted only to find that there was a sudden breakaway and the other team upset the apple cart by putting the ball past him into his net. And our runner too is getting distracted. His mind is elsewhere. And so when his moment comes, he messes up the changeover of the baton. Now the race is still on, but he's playing catch up. Now that was my clumsy way of saying we must value the season we are in. We must value that which is being passed on to us. We must certainly value the gospel. In fact, that's the main thing. We can't afford to drop that baton, friends. I don't know about you, but I want to be like Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, where he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Well, time has flown past and then it's time to uh, close the service. Uh, so we're going to now close in prayer. So let me just read the blessing to you. Let's bow our heads, shall we? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Father God, we have worshipped you and praised you this morning. And we come before you now as we close this service and pray, Father, that you would be with every single person who is viewing this, this uh, service and on this service with us this morning, praising you. We pray, Lord, that you would just bless each person until we see each other again. So, Lord, be blessed in everything that we have done and said and prayed this morning. We pray that you are our our Lord and our Saviour, and we look to you and you alone for all things. So, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in each one of our lives today, tomorrow, and next week. Lord, we thank you that you are our Lord and our Saviour, and you protect us and look over us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, it's time to say goodbye to our, our Facebook viewers. And we hope to see you again next week. Um, I hope you have all been blessed this morning. Bye for now. See you next week.